There's much talk lately about the possibility of another civil war in the United States. I have a whole playlist myself about that possibility. But if you look at history, civil wars often go together with revolutions. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. Could the triggering of a civil war actually begin with some form of revolution? If you look at the history of modern revolutions and modern civil wars, as I said in the opening, they often go together. The American Revolution was also a civil war. While we were fighting the British, we were also fighting the Loyalists, who were, well, not as well organized and dedicated and bent on victory, were probably about as numerous as the Patriots. So there was this civil war going on within the revolution. If you look at the French Revolution, it's a revolution, but there's also a civil war going on in various areas of France, most especially Western France, the Vendée, which was a, a horrible, brutal civil war. If you look at other civil wars, the Russian Civil War begins with the Russian Revolution. Uh, you could argue the Spanish Civil War also began with uh, a revolution of sorts from the left, overthrowing the old establishment. The same could be said to extent for China. Even if you look at the American Civil War, there are some historians who view it as the Second American Revolution. From a Southern viewpoint, they saw what they were doing as akin to what happened in 1775, 1776. They saw it not so much as secession, but as revolution. They were revolting against the North. Northerners, some Northern historians see it, saw it, and still see it as a second American revolution in the sense that we were completing the work of the first American revolution with regard to, you know, all men are created equal, basically eliminating at least the, the institution of slavery, if not all the stuff that came with it. So there is this connection between revolution and civil war and civil war and revolution, sort of like a chicken and egg argument often in a historical sense. Now, many of these videos I've talked about, you know, the lead up to another civil war, basically the loss of consensus in this country. And I think that's true and it's evident. I, I don't even think it can be contested. I mean, I, I would have no problem debating some progressive who wanted to say the opposite, that there are all sorts of consensus, elements of consensus left in this country, because there aren't. As I've posted in, in earlier videos, you know, I'll click the one here, you know, what's holding this country together? Why are we still a nation? And I meant that as, as a sincere question, a legitimate question. But let's look at the causes of the American Revolution, which many Americans are fuzzy about. I mean, I've been teaching about the American Revolution for basically 30 years. And I'll ask students, you know, why did we revolt against the British? And the, usually the vast overwhelming majority of students say, ah, because King George was a monarch. We were fighting against monarchy. And then I'll point out to them that we had been under a monarchy, except for a brief period of a commonwealth, you know, for almost two centuries. And that our biggest ally was a monarch, Louis in France, who gave us all the help and helped us win the war. And then, of course, the students are puzzled. We didn't rebel against George III because he was a monarch. We rebelled against George III because, in our view, he was a tyrant. And if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it's quite clear. Tyranny is the key. It's central to understanding the American Revolution. What did they mean by tyranny? Well, what was the purpose of government? Read the Declaration. Governments were, are instituted among men, in other words, this voluntary formation of government, not to do the will of the majority, but to protect people's rights. And the primary rights is outlined in the Declaration. This is an, ex an exclusive list. There are others, because Jefferson, after all, said, among these are, which implies there are others. But the main ones that he mentioned are, of course, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Now, this was all lifted from John Locke, who used the terms life, liberty, and property. So he didn't want to look like a complete plagiarist. So Jefferson changed it to pursuit of happiness, which is kind of almost looks like a progressive euphemism. But basically what he's talking about pursuit of happiness is property. So those are the three fundamental, central, basic rights to a citizen. Life, liberty, and property. Now, if you read the Declaration, you read what Jefferson primarily wrote, the key here is the phrase that when any a government of any form starts challenging those rights, doesn't fulfill its the need of government to protect those rights, you can get rid of it. You can amend it or abolish it. It doesn't matter what the form is. We weren't starting a revolution against King George III because he was a monarch. We were starting a revolution against King George III and Great Britain because he had become a tyrant. And he was a tyrant not because he was a monarchy. Other monarchs that we had lived under had not been tyrannical because they had protected our lives, our liberty, and our property. King George III appeared to be a threat to that. In that sense, he became a tyrant. But as Jefferson reminds us in the Declaration, which all these men signed and were adopted, any form of government was subject to becoming tyrannical. Monarchy could become tyrannical. It's clearly in the historical record. Aristocracy or oligarchy could become tyrannical. That's clear in the historical record as well. So could democracy. There are historical examples of democracy becoming tyrannical. There's no greater tyranny than the tyranny of a majority. Just ask African Americans. I mean, if, if the tyrant is one person, you need one bullet. If a tyrant is a, a bunch of aristocrats, you need a couple or several bullets, hundreds of bullets, maybe a thousand. But what do you do if you're black and you're an, a slave and the majority of the people are enslaving you? In Santo Domingo, where 98, 99% of the population were black slaves and they were enslaved by the 1%, the answer was simple. You rise up. You're the majority. You can... Once you get rolling, you can get rid of them. But what do you do if you're a minority? I mean, what worked in Haiti would not work in the United States. The slaves would have been slaughtered if they rose up like that because they were a minority. They were 20% of the population, not 98 or 99% of the population. There's no greater tyranny than the tyranny of a majority, democratic tyranny. That's why the Americans... The founders established a republic, not a democracy. So that leads me to today, and I've been talking about with regard to civil war consensus. With regard to revolution, I'd ask these questions. Does the federal government today protect lives? In some cases it does. I would argue in some cases it doesn't. You could argue abortion. You could argue the plight of African Americans. You know, does the government equally protect lives in this country? Question. I'm not going to answer it because I don't want to be, you know, shut down on YouTube for calling for revolution or something. So that's not what I'm doing. But I'm, I'm just run this through in your mind. Does the federal government today, and by extension the state governments, protect your property? What do you think? Does the federal government today, and by extension the state governments, is it protecting our liberties in a time of pandemic? You know, if you, you open a bar, you may get arrested. If you burn down a bar, probably not much is going to happen to you. You know, is government today protecting our property? So you've got life, liberty, and property. Those are the three things that the government, governments, federal and state, are supposed to be protecting. When Americans believed that the British government weren't protecting them anymore, you had a revolution.
which became a civil war. I've been asked a couple of times by people, verbal discussions, social media, comments on YouTube, what do you think the trigger will be for a civil war? And I really don't know. But if you go back and you think about this not as a civil war, but as being on a road maybe to revolution, then something does come to mind. You know, I, I teach American history. I started out as a European historian, and my focus was on Russia and East, Eastern Europe, the Russian Revolution. Read a lot about it, studied it, studied Marxism, studied lots of stuff related to it. And one of the things that struck me with both the American Revolution and the Russian Revolution, even though they were, you know, poles apart politically, there were key works that led to both of those revolutions. The Russian Revolution, you had a, a pamphlet by Lenin, Stow uh, Dalat, What is to be Done, which was published, I think it was 1901, I think it was 1902. And, and basically, without going through the whole thing, what Lenin said was, no matter what was happening, the best the masses could do, the workers, the peasants could do, would be to form unions. That they could never pull off a revolution on their own. That would only come from a dedicated cadre of revolutionaries who would, what later becomes, you could say, is the, becomes the dictatorship of the proletariat. That they had to lead the way. And that's, of course, the position he takes and pursues as uh, his group in the Russian Social Democratic Party, the Bolsheviks. You get to the Bolshevik Revolution. And it always intrigued me because you can see a similar, uh, what would you call it, similar developments in the American Revolution. In the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson himself writes that no matter how crappily people are treated by the government, no matter how tyrannical it is, they're usually slow to revolt. It's not an easy thing to do. There's inertia, an element of inertia which keeps them from taking action. And of course, one of the things that happens in the American Revolution, well, you have you know, the formation of organizations, you know, the Sons of Liberty and other like organizations in the various states or well, colonies at that point. But you also have publication uh, in, in early 1776 of Tom Paine's book, Common Sense, which, although the, the politics are very different, Paine isn't a proto-Marxist, although he would probably be considered relatively left-leaning today. His book sort of played an even bigger role than Lenin's book, you know, What is to be Dumb Played? Because, and it was much more immediate. I mean, Lenin's pamphlet came out in 1902. Revolution doesn't happen until 1917. Paine's book came out in early 1776. And by the summer, we're declaring independence. It, it's a, a book that at the time, in some ways still is, one of the best-selling books in American history. I mean, it was a very small country, and it sold a couple million co copies. It was read in churches, floated around, exchanged. Everybody knew the argument. And I won't go into the arguments of common sense here. But it performed that same role. It was the sort of a lightning rod that got people thinking from one way to another way, because the American mind had been on seeking an accommodation with the British. As, as Jefferson had said, you get into these situations, you need to either alter or abolish, you know, whatever scheme you're operating under. And we went from the one to the other with common sense. Now, one can argue that it's because of Paine's book, or that Paine was catching the mood in the country and reflecting it in what he wrote. Chicken or egg, we don't know. It's hard to tell. 
They didn't have polling in those days. So you don't know what people were thinking. But generally, people attribute to Payne and his pamphlet, which actually is much more like a book. It's, it's fairly long. The change of mind among the American colonists, at least those who were considered themselves the patriots, and move them toward cutting off ties with Britain. You know, we're not trying to change our relationship with you. We're trying to end it. You know, we're not going through counseling. We want a divorce. And in that sense, I, I always saw Payne as sort of like Lenin, uh, not in their politics, but in the role they played in setting up what was necessary for an outright revolution. So that's, you know, what I think about this. Maybe what we're waiting for is Tom Paine. You know, I, he, could be, he could be on the left. He could be on the right. But whoever comes up with a pamphlet, a book, maybe a video, underlining these problems and the response to these problems in the way that Tom Paine did, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin did in 1902, maybe that'll be the trigger, the spark, the iskra, as the Russians would say, that would set off a conflagration in this country. So it may not be an event that we're waiting for. It may be a person. You know, who's the person who can lay out the way Lenin did, the way Payne did, a course of action? Those are my thoughts. What are yours? Leave a comment. You liked the video, got something out of it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. You didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Subscribe to the channel. Love subscriptions. And until the next time, keep fighting.